Hi everyone, it's four o'clock. Um, I'm Jutta Mata and I'm excited to present the next point on the agenda, the panel on value of data. I can also already see Marco Strohmeyer, welcome. And there'll also be uh, Thomas Fetzer and Florian Stahl. Silvia Westerbeek is in her car um, on the way home in Ohio, but she'll make it on time and she's listening to us already. Here's what will happen. Um, my suggestion is, I'll explain you a little bit about the panel and who you'll see and hear. Then we have two talks, two commentaries, um, and then a general discussion. Florian, are you with us as well? Florian Stahl. Hi. Okay. I'm pretty excited about this panel because it combines four disciplines. So we have law, we have economics, uh, marketing, and communication, and applied informatics. Is that correct? That it's applied informatics. And I'm a psychologist, and I'll try to ask psychology questions. So maybe it's even five disciplines. My name is Jota Mata. I'm a professor of health psychology here at the University of Mannheim, and I'm also one of the directors of the Mannheim Center of Data Science. And our four panelists are, I'll start in the order how they will present. The first is Thomas Fetze, who is a professor of public law, regulatory law, and tax law here at the University of Mannheim. He has a master's of laws from Vanderbilt University. He has been a chair of economic law and tax law at the Technical University of Dresden before joining Mannheim in 2012. And he's also an adjunct professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania. His research, and you'll hear more about this, so I'll only touch this briefly. He specializes in antitrust and regulatory law, as well as privacy law, with a focus on questions relating to digitalization and data protection. You correct me, Thomas, if I'm messing this up. I'm not a law specialist. Wonderful. Um, and from Thomas Ketze and the next person, Florian Stral, you'll hear more about their research. So I won't talk as much about it as, by, um, as about the research from the commentators. Florian Stahl is professor of marketing here at the University of Mannheim. Um, he's an economist and he has a master's from the University of Zurich, a PhD from the University of St. Gallen. He did a postdoc at the Columbia Business School, was an assistant professor at the University of Zurich until in 2013, he became a professor of quantitative quantitative marketing and consumer analytics here at the University of Mannheim. Um, your research, like Florian's research interests are empirical quantitative marketing, marketing analytics and business, business economics. Um, the first commentator is Markus Strohmeier. We have never met personally. It's a really pleasure to see you here. Um, Markus Strohmeier studied informatics. Um, he is the Chair for Methods and Theories of Computational Social Sciences and Humanities at the, I don't know how you translate the RWTH, it's a Technical University of Aachen. It's a, a very renowned university here in Germany. He's also the Founder and Scientific Coordinator for Digital Behavioral Data at the Gieses Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences. He did his PhD at uh, Graz University, a postdoc at the University of Toronto. He was a visiting professor at Stanford University and at Xerox Park. And before he became professor in Aachen and um, uh, at the Leibniz Institute, Halle Silvia, he also um, was an assistant professor at the University of Graz. And um, his interests are in applying and developing computational techniques to research challenges on the intersections between computer science and the social sciences. Um, and you develop methods and techniques for studying social data. And to give this a little bit more flavor, because I think you won't talk as much as about your research, maybe as the first two speakers, maybe, but maybe you do, that would be lovely. Um, papers where this, I think, is uh, nicely shown are, for example, when politicians talk, assessing online conversational practices of political parties on Twitter, or mining cross-cultural relations from Wikipedia, where you compared uh, 31 European food cultures. So. Welcome, we really look forward to this. And Silvia Knoblauch Besterbeek, thank you for joining. I think you had quite a ride to get here, so thanks for being here. Um, she'll be the second commentator. Silvia Knoblauch Besterbeek is a professor at the School of Communication. She's a communication scientist. Um, she did her master's at the University of Music, Theater and Media in Hanover. Hanover uh, was a postdoc at the University of Alabama, had appointments at the Technical University of Dresden, was a professor at the University of California at Davis, and since 2005 has been a professor at the Ohio State University. 
Her research is on uh, selection, processing, and effects of mediated communication. She uses computational methods. She is the first from whom I heard the term um, computational communication sciences. And, and one of the questions that she's interested in is uh, self-concept, that is how people use media to regulate their self, and especially in online and social media. Uh, it's about extended selves, such as a second self or quantified self. So, Welcome, everybody. I really look forward to hearing your talks, your comments, and to the discussion. And the first to talk is Thomas Fetzer. You have 15 minutes. And my suggestion would be the direct questions can be asked after your talk, and general questions we keep for the end. All right. So thank you, Jutta, for the kind introduction. And I'd suggest that we start with um, the boring part, which would be the law, um, the law part. Um, so what I would like to talk about is how the law influences the value of data and, and what needs to be changed, maybe to increase the efficient and total welfare enhancing use of data. We, we all know that, law, uh, that data oftentimes is described as being the new oil or gold or whatsoever. And I, I think what it basically means is that data, data potentially is very valuable. But it's not a big surprise, and um, I'm not telling you something new here, that uh, data has very distinct features compared to oil and gold. And uh, the two most important distinct features are that data is non rivalrous in consumption. So I can use it, and the same day my data can be used by another person, which is very different from oil, because once it's burned, it's burned. And the second problem is that data is not fully excludable. So once I've shared data with others, it's hard to uh, prevent them from sharing it with third parties. So this can be described as uh, data as a commons or a club good. And, and we all know uh, the, the literature and the tragedy of the commons. So club goods and, and common goods uh, tend to be used inefficiently, there's a free rider problem. Um, so people don't really want to, potentially don't want to invest in data because they know if they invest in the creation of data and third parties can um, make use of that data, there's potentially an underinvestment and there potentially is a redu reduction of total welfare. So assuming, and, and you buy that in very short, this is an argument why data is very different from oil and, and thereby there might be an inefficient use of data. And by inefficient use of data, what I mean is basically that data is not necessarily held by the person or held by the person which makes the most efficient use out of it. Um, the question is how can we increase the value of data? So how can we basically solve that problem of, of the common good here? I mean, the standard textbook answer is basically that you have three options. So one is that you have a governmental provision of data, um, which doesn't have to take into account the free rider problems and can invest in the creation and the exchange of data without having um, to worry about um, spending money, which, it, uh, which the government doesn't get an appropriate return on. Um, and, and we see first discussions here, especially in Germany, especially regarding public data, whether public data should be a public good, should be provided by the government and, and shared, especially if it comes to data, which is uh, important for research. The second textbook solution is that you rely basically on, on contracts, right? So a person who has data that another person could make more efficient use of, um, they are engaging in negotiations and, and so there will be a contract and then they exchange data uh, in exchange for remuneration. That creates a lot of transaction cost um, and the transaction will not happen if the transaction costs are potentially higher than the value that uh, the, the wealth party, parties attribute to the data. And since oftentimes we don't really know what a value of data is, there is a danger that um, contracts alone will not solve the problem that data is not necessarily held by the person which makes the most efficient use out of it. And third, and, and now I'm finally coming to the law why I was trying to engage in a little bit economics here, which I'm clearly not the expert here. The third uh, way to deal with this problem and how the law usually deals with this problem is 
that we create property rights, right? So if you have a property right, that basically means you can exclude others from using it. You can transfer the property right in exchange for money, and thereby you can create an efficient status where uh, data is transferred to the person who makes the most efficient use. And most efficient use, what I mean, is the total welfare enhancing use. So if we look to the law and how property rights regarding data are um, constructed at that point, we basically have to distinguish two sets of different data. Um, one is personal data, and, and the other one is non-personal data. We clearly could start here with the question whether it's still possible to distinguish personal from non-personal data. But uh, at that point, let's just assume that you can distinguish personal data from non-personal data, even though you can make the argument that basically any data today is personal data, because by combining different data sets, you eventually will be able to attribute any piece of information to, to a natural person. When it comes to personal data, we have a very strict legal regime dealing with that kind of data. So personal data basically means any kind of information which can be attributed to a specific um, human being. We have the GDPR, as we all know, so the General Data Protection Regulation. The General Data Protection Regulation is not really a property right. It's more coming from a personality perspective. It's uh, deeply enshrined in, uh, in German constitutional law, going back to human dignity as part of personality. So it's a very personality-related right, but uh, in its effect, it's a very strong property right. What do I mean with very strong property right? The holder, so the data subject, the data owner, if you want, can exclude others totally from, from using that data. Um, personal rights cannot ultimately transfer to another person. So the individual which, to which data is related to all, always retains some residual right. Um, so you cannot fully transfer it to others. Um, the data subject can give its consent that others can use the data, but uh, the consent can be reclaimed at any point or can be taken back at any point. So um, even if I transfer data to another person at any point in time, I can say I want it back now. Um, data subjects have a right to data portability. Um, so I can take my data with me, even though I've shared it with a third person. And there are many restrictions to using personal data, like um, the principles of purpose limitation, data minimization, and so on and so forth. So what we do see is a very strong legal protection of personal data. And personal data, as far as I understand, potentially is one which could be very valuable um, for different purposes. So I'm sure Flo Ben Stahl will talk about this, but also for research personal data, for medical research personal data could be very useful. There we do have a very strong um, legal protection. When it comes to non-personal data, um, the situation is very different. Um, we do not know, as far as I know, in no jurisdiction at that point, uh, any property rights in, in terms of personal data. So there is no IP right, there is no, uh, no, no other property right in, in terms of paid in, in personal data. We arguably could say parts of data can be protected by a statute which is called or EU directive, which is called database protection, but it's only a very, very limited scope. So data itself is not protected by any property right at that point. So what you really need at that point, if you want to exchange data, so if one data owner wants to, owner, uh, wants to transfer data to another person, you need contracts because that's the only thing that the law supports at that point. The question is if Theoretically, property rights are one of the legal instruments that we tend to use if we want to increase the value of something because we want to protect the owner. Should there be a new property right for data? And, and that's basically part of my research. Should we have something like an, a, a, a patent or something like that for data, um, which, we, which we have for, for technical inventions? Should we have a copyright or something like that? So should there be a new right created um, by the law. Um, I don't want to go into all the bullet points for reasons of time, and I don't want to um, be too long here. But um, just to highlight one example, one important feature here of property rights is um, that there are absolute rights. And absolute rights means 
um, they can be enforced towards anybody and not only to the by the uh, parties to a contract. Um, they create a high level of uh, legal certainty because you know very precisely what you can do with your property and what you can't do with your property. They can be easily enforced in court. Uh, damage claims are very um, easy and, and there's a long-standing legal history how to enforce such damage claims uh, for, for intellectual property. One of the great disadvantages at that point, and that's the only one that I would like to highlight here, is so one of the great disadvantages is um, property rights tend to be very um, stable and static and not very flexible. So once you actually know how you, you want to create a property right um, and, and you are in a, in a uh, um, developed market or in a developed industry, um, it's a very good idea to have property rights. If you don't really know who is the person who makes the most efficient use out of data, in, in my example, it's really hard how to, you want to define a property right. But once you have defined a property right to a certain degree, you, you stick with that decision because the legislator will not change property rights um, every year or so. So creating property rights has some, some advantages, but clearly also some disadvantages. What are the advantages of contractual solutions? So option B would be not to create a property right, but to stick with the current situation where people have to rely on contracts as a basis for exchanging data. Um, one of the great advantages clearly is flexibility. So the freedom of contract allows you to agree on pretty much everything you want to agree on. And you can have tailor-made solutions for exchanging data, for sharing data, for using data together and so on and so forth. Um, two of the great disadvantages um, that I would like to highlight at that point is contracts are necessarily incomplete. That's one of the lessons that we teach all our law students. You can spend an endless amount of time on drafting a contract. You will forget something that you didn't foresee because life tends to be different than drafting, drafting a contract. The second problem is Contracts, there's a relativity of contractual obligations. So only the parties to a contract will be bound up by the contract. If there's a breach of contract, for example, so I agree with someone to share data with this other person and this other person breaches our contract and shares the data with a third person, there's pretty much nothing that I could do in relation to the third person. So contracts come with the advantage of flexibility, but with the clear disadvantages that I just described. So in the situation, um, what are we doing? There are advantages for co contractual solutions and for new property rights. The European Union had launched, a had launched a consultation process on whether we should have property rights and that ended nowhere. So it was one of these consultations which started with great ambitions and then you didn't hear anything about it. Um, as far as I can tell, there's no discussion currently whether we should have a property right, but instead discussion has shifted to the question whether we should have especially in competition law cases, data sharing obligations. And that's especially applicable to dominant companies which have, easy, uh, in easy words, a certain market share. How could these data access rights look like? There are basically two discussions here. So one is whether data can create an essential facility. An essential facility is a legal term which is used in competition law. If a dominant company, a company with market power controls an essential facility, that means under certain circumstances, it can be obliged to share the data and to give access to the data to, to competitors, basically. Uh, the requirements for that under the law are if data is necessary for new uses, so for innovative new products, if data cannot easily be duplicated by a third party and data holder has no business justification to refuse giving access to others, it can be uh, forced by competition authorities to share the data with others. The problem here is obvious. If you're in a, we have heard this discussion with patents on, on vaccines, for example. If, if you're forced to share what you own, you might also have a, a, a smaller interest or a, yeah, a smaller interest to in this, invest in that. And what is clearly, what's totally unclear is on what terms and conditions such uh, sharing obligations should work. A standard answer of, uh, of lawyers is friend. Friend means fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. And um, if you ask me what fair means, I have no idea. So when we talk about here data access rights, which are currently discussed, 
I, I think um, it's a great idea which will go nowhere in practice. Second idea which is discussed currently is uh, whether we should have interoperability obligations for data. So if two or more companies have data sets, um, why don't we force them to combine them and, and force them to, um, to put their data sets together? Um, and, and the idea is this interoperability and portability can have positive effects and prevent uh, lock-in effects. And interoperability, um, however, interoperability can reduce and the ability to compete between these companies. Um, plus, um, and that's a typical lawyer's um, problem here, um, and, and that's why I'm very thankful for, for being able to discuss this with you, lawyers tend to believe that everything comes in Excel format. So if we think about interoperability, we think all data is available in Excel and portability is not very difficult. I have learned that this is not true. Um, so interoperability and portability uh, might be a good idea if you don't have any idea, uh, any knowledge about the technology. So to sum up, and I think I've used my time, um, um, what I would say is what we, when we talk about the value of data, what we need to have in mind is um, that the legal protection of data will have a major impact on the value of data. Um, and at the current uh, point, I see two problems. Um, we have a very strong protection, legal protection of personal data, and this very strong legal protection of personal data um, leads to a total welfare reducing use of data. Um, and we have seen this in, in the current pandemic. Many, and I know that this has been the topic today already, um, many problems could have been solved easier um, if, if uh, personal data could have been shared easier. And I'm just talking about the Corona um, app here at, at that point. And at the same time, which seems to be a paradox, um, we have a very legal, weak legal protection of non-personal data. The result of a too strong legal protection is the same as, a result, as of a too weak legal restriction. We potentially see a total welfare reducing use of non-personal data because if persons, or if um, data owners don't know how their data is protected, protected, it might be that they are not willing to share it with others or transfer it to other uh, with other to others, which could make a more efficient use to the benefit of the entire society. Having said that, um, thank you very much for your attention. I, I think I stayed within the time almost, and I'm looking forward to the discussions and the further presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. You took one extra minute, which I think is totally <laughs> within the scope. Thank you so much. There's already one direct question to you, and I would take it before we go to the next um, presentation. Would that be okay? okay. So um, the question is, would the property rights complicate the use of big data? To a certain degree, it, it potentially would. Um, make the use of big data more complicated. Um, and, and what immediately comes to my mind is when we talk about uh, standard essential patents and, and patents that you need to use to compose a smartphone, where you need to get the consent of one million, uh, one million patent owners if you want to, uh, to manufacture a new smartphone. And if you have big data where you have a, a whole bunch of um, of data owners which need to agree to the use of data, it, it can complicate. Um, um, the use of big data. However, one potential solution would have something like data banks or financial institutions for data or other intermediaries, which um, we also know in uh, know from other intellectual property um, right situations. So, for example, GEMA and VG Ward, who enforce property rights for single data owners in in order to reduce transaction costs that someone who wants to use data of another person or intellectual property of another person don't has to doesn't have to negotiate on a single basis with with each um, owner so the answer is, as a lawyer i would say it's a typical answer it depends potentially it will make the world more complicated but i think there there are solutions which could solve that those problems and just for, for my understanding, when GEMA or like Frau Gewort, like these are German institutions, one is for music rights, if, like you correct me, the other one is for uh, written texts in German. But here you can clearly identify who's the author, which might be a bit different, right? It's a different scale and a different kind sure. of ownership. Sure. So, 
Sure, that, that, that's right. You have individual owners and you can clearly identify who, who created something and, and um, that's different from, uh, from, from big data where you don't necessarily know who could, at what level was created um, a data set by, by whom. So that's definitely a more complicated. But if you think um, at, uh, in, in the direction of data trustees, um, which um, take a role, so that the GEMA and the FOGI one are not perfect, it sounds, but the idea is that you have some kind of intermediaries who reduce transaction costs by bundling um, different data sets and, and um, making sure that the data, the data owners or those who contributed to those data sets get compensated adequately. It sounds like a very interesting move. I'm going to say, it sounds as if you really have to find new solutions. And it's um, interesting to hear your perspective on it. Thank you very much, Tomo. Um, I don't see any other questions directly at you. So I would um, say, Florian, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much so for the invitation. Um, let me share also my screen for a moment. So here, OK. I have here just to organize a little bit my screen. Sorry for this. Um, yeah, thank you, Jutta, for the introduction also from my side and also thank you for the invitation in general also to this um, particular online conference here. Um, I'm happy to also share some, let's say, more, let's say, up higher level also thoughts about value of data from a business perspective as also this as a, in the moment also a big topic or not just in the moment, I would say in the last 10, 15 years already a big topic in business in general and also is evolving tremendously in the last whatever three, four years. Um, let me start also with some general thoughts and that is also a, we can say data became already a source of firms value creation and also some um, studies like from Gartner also says that actually 90% of corporate strategies will in just next year explicitly mention information as a critical enterprise asset. And information is here also um, synonym also of data and analytics also an essential competency. And also from a business perspective, therefore data and analytics belongs very uh, much together. Then also um, another Thing which I think is also important to see is that also next year they expect that 30% of the chief data officers and companies will actually partner with their chief financial officers um, to value also the organization's information assets uh, for also improved information management and benefits. So that's also another sign that also data is not just a side product anymore in companies, but actually also is getting in the core of a business model in many companies. And the third observation is also that in the next years, also data literacy might become an explicit necessary driver of business value. So that means also the capabilities to read and to also understand data and also to work with data is actually then um, crucial in business because data itself is a source of, let's say, of uh, value, also of profits um, in a company. Now, but with these general thoughts, um, what we can see is that um, companies, um, of course, in the last 10, 15, 20 years, increasingly engage and also invest in data and business analytics. I would say 10 years ago, it was just investing in technology for data. Today, also, they invest more and more also in organizational topics and also in people. But also at the beginning, it was just in the technology context. The, the main reasons were from the beginning, and that is, I think, the obvious to enhance efficiency and also productivity. So that means also using data for more controlling and also to uh, measuring uh, the performance and then also improving. But I think more and more also companies realize that they actually also create uh, through this uh, competitive advantage. And the question is also which of the competitors actually is better able um, to work with data and potentially also this competitor is then actually outperforming the others in the same market. And a third, and that is, I think, another reason also, which is perhaps you know, also in the last four, five, six years more um, dominant is that also they are used to innovate and also transform existing business models. And that this is not just, let's say, some academic thinking also is, I think, shown with this um, overview. When you look also in the top 10 or the 10 largest companies in the world by market value, 
that is from February 2021, so some months ago, you will see that actually also um, today we have Apple, we have Microsoft, we have Amazon, we have Alphabet, we have Facebook, we have also um, uh, Alibaba Group, and in between also some data close companies like also Tesla, um, or also some uh, Tencent uh, in China. So that means many of these 10 largest companies in terms of market value um, are already quite data driven. And some like, uh, you know, Alphabet, that means Google or Facebook or Alibaba basically would not exist without data. So that means also here, this is, um, I think, a, a very strong evidence that these companies make billions of profit every year by, they, by just using data. So this is, um, Google is just collecting data, transforming somehow the data and then returns some, let's say, transformed value to us as consumers, as whatever in search, in terms of search or others, other services. And that is also then leading at the end to really um, a huge profit uh, for, for Google every year, actually. So therefore also, um, Data is no longer, it's no longer just an idea that they will create value. I think the, the exists a lot of evidence. And luckily also in the last five years, a lot of this sleeping German companies also woke up and also now create quite some part of their revenues and also profits actually by using data. But now how do companies actually generate now this uh, value um, out of the data? In general, we can distinguish uh, two, two, two general uh, you know, areas. The one is, of course, and that is also what um, perhaps most comes to mind when I talk also to companies or to managers, is of course analytics. So you use also this, you know, all these famous uh, buzzwords, predictive, prescriptive analytics, artificial intelligence, data mining, and so on. But the second that is also, I think, um, now more and more getting common is that um, companies develop uh, database services. So that means that they can reuse this data for various purposes. Um, one is analytics and the second might be also database services. And analytics is in some sense um, a mediator also to turn um, data into a value for a company because data per se have no value. So that means when you also just look in, you know, a random data set, most likely um, it's of zero value for us, but it can also in some context, of course, um, be used um, when you analyze it in a particular way and also you build a strategy around, you use the right technology, data management and so on, that you also derive some insights. And then also when companies are also able to derive insights, which also leads to actions. And these actions also then can be measured in terms of a business KPI of a you know, key performance indicator um, that could be a revenue or that could be also a cost uh, key performance indicator. So then also you can argue that also um, through the analytics. So that means using this data, you actually, um, Cre uh, created a value. So that means when I know that I reduced the cost to produce something or also the cost of delivery or the cost of logistic by 20 or 30%, and this uh, cost reduction has happened through the analytics of the data. So then I can argue that the data which I used for this, I have actually a particular amount that means potentially um, some millions of euros when actually uh, you reduce the cost of logistic by this amount of euros. And that is then one, one area. And there exists almost an exponential uh, you know, increase in use cases or in case studies today for basically all areas in business, in companies, in customer context, everywhere. Uh, it's really, it's like a COVID exponential. So it's, uh, I think in 2013, when I first really more looked in this, I found, I think 20, 30 cases. I think today we are, in the range of 10,000, 20,000 cases, uh, which also show how business analytics um, in many, many, in all areas in the company can actually create value. And just here, some, some, some general areas like, you know, that you also have custom experience or innovation or also performance or, you know, customization and prediction optimization. So it's, I think um, it's, a, it's an absolute not complete list of areas. But one important thing is, and that is also, of course, uh, crucial, we have one aspect and that is also the time value of data that also, um, of course, the older often the data are, the lower is also the value. But it's not just that you have the data in a very fast manner. It's also um, important that you are able in a company context 
also to capture the data, to analyze the data, and also an action can happen. So that means also the business event and the action is, should be very close together. Then also, of course, the time value of the data is very high. And often this is, cannot be done in any manual sense, so though you need also some automation for this. And I think also one obvious example, which we all know is where also one, um, uh, which is also an example for this is also perhaps Google Maps, where also the business event, or this is perhaps not the business event, so some event on the traffic is actually also um, analyzed in a very fast manner that immediately I get also um, the information about the, the traffic jam, or I get also in the next second also information how long it takes to go to a particular place and so on. So that means here, this is very close together. But the opposite is also true, so that my, many companies still um, are not able really to capture this time value because the internal processes are actually too long. Um, and that is not necessarily, the, the, it's not the problem of capturing the data, it's often the problem of analyzing the data and also taking action. And so then also it's sometimes um, too long. But I think especially in my own context, marketing also in social media context, companies also improved a lot. So that means also companies today react on in social media, for example, in, in minutes. Uh, that means also here there is already um, quite an improvement. So that means also you cannot wait in such a context for a day or two days and then respond to a post. So you have to do this very fast. But now the second uh, area, which I already mentioned before, is also next to this analytics part, also um, the, the database services. And the database services are a second area or a second abroad also to create um, the value out of data. So that means, again, you can use data. Then you also, this data allows you to build on top of this also such a database service. And that might also then um, lead to an improvement of, I call it now a customer key performance indicator like customer satisfaction or also um, customer retention. So that means that the customer also is of course getting a benefit out of it and then also is getting loyal to this. Um, what that means, again, of course, you use also here some you know, approaches like predictive or prescriptive analytics or whatever. So that means very similar technologies actually you're using also for these database services. But also to, to, to make this more concrete, also here an example from let's say a home IoT example where also um, customers also get a benefit now to have whatever some smart um, appliances at home. And also you, you, of course in company context, we have also the so-called smart factories today where also machines talk to other machines and exchange information. And then also everything can actually be um, improved through the, such a um, data-based digital service. But to even might make it more uh, specific what, the, what that means in terms of business model transformation, here an example of uh, Nike. So Nike is not of course a new product and it's also quite, Nike is not a new brand. It's um, actually a brand which exists now since 70 years. And when you really think about Nike, Nike is making basically a commodity. They're making shoes. And shoes are nothing special. So that means in general, they make just shoes. So that means, of course, we all need shoes, but of course, you, it's not necessary to buy shoes from Nike. They make basically a commodity. But what Nike differentiates from other, let's say, shoemakers is that they also build this brand on top. And that is also the reason why many also consumers not just buy any sneaker, which you might get also, but I don't know, 20, 30 euros actually, uh, they also pay for a Nike sneaker then actually, or they pay for this 100 euros. And that is also how Nike actually grow in the last whatever 70 years, basically through branding. So that means also consumers also, um, also bought these shoes because of they admire this brand and then also um, uh, pay instead of 20, 30 euros also 100. But now also, um, this business model is still, of course, existing, but also it's extended also, it's transformed in a sense that also Nike actually also is building such a database services. And here an example might be that they have some, let's say, sensors in their shoes, which allow also in particular the running community to drag on the iPhone the, the style of running or to have a personal training um, plan, also to, to have a lot of, let's say, data-driven services which allow, for example, themselves uh, to have a very personalized, customized training plan for the next marathon. So, and that is of course, then also um, now 
on top a service which Nike is offering to their customers, which leads, of course, to an additional benefit, in particular, if you are also buying these shoes for a sport reason. And just to say this, these shoes actually cost no longer 100 euros, which a regular, let's say, type of sneaker from Nike might cost. Actually, these shoes are in the range of 250 to 350 euros. So that means consumers are paying now a lot more to have this digital, um, this database digital service um, on top. And of course, at the same time, that is also the fantastic situation for Nike. Actually, also Adidas and Puma are offering also such shoes. Um, they also are staying then very long time loyal to Nike because you cannot switch to Adidas afterwards because your training plan in the Nike app is, of course, just working with Nike shoes and also is after some time so much customized to your personal training style that also um, you are not able anymore to switch to a competitor. So that means at the same time, Nike is increasing willingness to pay and also is increasing, of course, their revenues through this uh, database digital service and also increasing um, the customer loyalty. And the best is actually the customers who are buying this type of shoes are very happy. So therefore also it's um, at the end, um, I think an example to show how you can create today um, value out of data, not just in terms of profit. So that is often what people from the business professors think, we just think of the profits. Actually also customers are also um, here having a benefit and also are willing to pay for this benefit um, additional money and still are quite satisfied. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Um, that is what I thought to share. Of course, just to refer to the former talk by also Thomas Fetzer, I can say that all these topics are super crucial also for us, in particular, as we discuss in the moment, data monetization and data markets and all this, um, which is getting, of course, an uh, important additional revenue stream for companies in the future. And then is of course, the question, who is owning this data? So and that is, um, in the moment, I think uh, most consumers are not aware of it and therefore sign contracts um, that at the end, Bosch and Daimler and all these other companies who track this data are owning it actually. So therefore also, and that is different to this personal data that also this, let's say machine generated data are owned, not by the ones who really generate it in their context, but actually by the ones who produce the machine. But thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward now to your questions. Thank you very much, Florian. If you have any direct questions uh, to this talk, please write them in the chat. I think they're all still thinking about the Nike shoes, whether they should buy them or not, or whether they should get Adidas. And if there are any questions coming later, I'll direct them. Oh, there's one. Okay. So the commentators have to um, save their questions. So do I. I also have like some more general questions. So I think we can just continue. Thank you very much, Florian. Thank you. And the first commentator is Markus Strohmeier. Okay. Uh Thank you very much for two very uh, interesting presentations on the value of data. And uh, I'm excited to have this panel on value of data because I, I think understanding the value of data is a prerequisite for uh, being sure that the value that is created through data can be distributed in a fair and equal manner. Very often the data producers are kind of economically discoupled from those that uh, tap into the economic benefits of data. And in order to think about models that kind of um, deal with this question, understanding how to measure the value of data to me seems like a quite important question. And what I want to perhaps discuss a bit is uh, how could we actually put a number on the value of data? How could we actually uh, put some a euro or a dollar uh, number uh, on some certain subset of a data set, for example, that would be in some kind of informative where we understand how this value has been derived. And what has been, uh, I think, uh, emphasized by Florian Stahl, for example, is that data gets valuable in a usage context. 
uh, once we have some kind of idea of what to use data for, uh, for example, maybe analyze it for cost savings, or it could be used for predicting uh, what kind of adver advertisements a user might click on or what kind of products a user might buy, uh, then we are very close to some kind of economic impact of a data that is used as part of a model that aims to predict something. Uh, and that's where I, I want to perhaps, um, and, and the question is, can we, when we think about uh, the value of data in that very technical way, uh, sort of data that is used to inform modeling, uh, to make predictions and things like that, are there then ways to assign numbers to sub-segments of the data? So for example, if I'm a customer of Amazon, would there be a way of assigning uh, a certain euro amount to the data that I provide to Amazon. Uh, and that euro amount would be calculated, for example, based on how much my data contributes to informing uh, recommendations that are displayed on Amazon to other users. Uh, that is a rather, uh, I would say, small question, but this is a question that could be experimentally explored. We could actually uh, do something that is uh, quite popular in artificial intelligence research. I think there are equivalents in the social sciences as well, uh, ablation studies, uh, where we could, um, in, in artificial intelligence, what ablation studies are doing is they're taking out certain components of a neural network, then they're rerunning the training of the model, and then they're exploring the impact of uh, the ablation on the outcome. So it could be that the model degrades, for example, if important components of the model are taken out. What I'm envisioning uh, is to come back to the Amazon example, what we could do is we could take out um, my data from an Amazon training data set for a recommendation model, and then try to uh, predict uh, how much penalty in terms of revenue incurs is incurred on that. And maybe my data alone is not sufficient, but maybe it's all uh, people who are members of a certain socio-demographic group, right? Maybe we look at data by uh, people who are uh, Amazon Prime members, or maybe it's male or female or, or other kinds of groups. And that would give some kind of idea of what is the value of certain groups of data producers for a given purpose to a given company. And once these, um, and one can calculate those numbers, for example, through ablation studies. And once these numbers are transparent, I think uh, one could start a conversation about uh, participative models, uh, participative data-driven models, where perhaps the people who supply the data uh, become members of the economic system, where they are somehow rewarded for the data that they contribute. Um, this is not the case today. What we typically have today is that we have uh, a service that is given to a user and the user pays by delivering data to the platform. And uh, thinking about the value of data, I think opens up all these kinds of questions uh, on how we want to uh, distribute the value that is generated by data across different stakeholders. Uh, and maybe I'll stop at this point and I don't know how much time I had available. Maybe this is too short, too long, but I'll, I'll be happy to jump in at a later point again. It's, it's, to my understanding, it's perfect because that's the comment you had. And I think it linked really well to both Thomas and Florian to understand, like, um, I'm still thinking about this example that uh, Thomas gave about um, whether we can do something similar as we do with music and text rights with um, data value rights. And I think Florian gave a very clear um, idea of how you can generate money with data. So thank you very much for doing this. Um, are there any direct questions to Markus Stromayer's comment at this point? Just write them in the chat um, and you have to be a fast writer because I think I'll just, um, I don't see anything. I don't see any notion, but if it comes, I'll let you know. So I would go to our second commentary by Silvia Kumbloch Nesterwick. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, Frau Kreuter and your team for inviting me. And thank you, Jutta, for the warm welcome and for your patience with me, <laughs> making it just in time here. So um, 
I want to thank also the presenters. I do have questions for them. And uh, while I was listening, I also took some like pictures of their slides. So I will just go through my notes sequentially here and I'll probably stop because I'll be longer if I go through all of them in five minutes for sure. So I'm, I'm very intrigued by this interdisciplinary nature of the panel. I think we're coming from very different perspectives. So I feel a little bit on thin ice here. I'm not a marketing or a law expert by any means. So we'll see how this goes. Um, but let me start with the first thing that stood out to me. Um, so um, Thomas Fetzer commented on data being similar, uh, being reusable, usable by many um, individuals. Uh, they don't lose uh, I don't know, usability if several people do uh, take advantage of them. Well, at some point they will. It reminded me very much of certain characteristics of media messages. They become more valuable the more people they actually use. Like Facebook, if, if you are a member of Facebook and you're the only one, it's useless. The more people are using Facebook, the more valuable it is. And similarly, media messages, you often don't know the value of what you're getting. You might tune into a movie and might not be at all what you were hoping for. <laughs> Maybe you cry instead of being amused or whatever. And it's kind of similar to with data sets. You buy something, a data set, or, and you don't really know how valuable it will be to you in the end. Um, what you can make of it, you don't know all the details of the data set. So it just resonated with me, that comparison, um, that data are in many ways like media messages to consumers. You don't always know what you're getting ahead of time. It could be very valuable in the one in a lifetime experience, media exposure, or the, the data set that really changes your business model, but it's very difficult to know that ahead of time. Uh, the comments from uh, Markus Strohmeyer also made me think of uh, a question that I had while I was listening to Thomas Fetzer. Um, who are the players and who's owning the data? And I was thinking of, of me as an individual media user. Right now, I don't have much of a right there. I don't have real property to my data, even though Amazon, by tracking what I'm clicking on, what I'm viewing, um, is creating value or, or, or advantages, for, so to speak, for their business model. But I have no, even though I'm creating the data in a way, uh, I have no ownership, no advantage, aside from maybe if I'm an, an MTurk member, you know, then I'm getting paid for. But that's just an interesting notion to me that I'm actually the one as an individual user creating the data in, in many ways. They're capturing what I'm doing. And that kind of data information is then oftentimes being sold. I mean, that's what's Google, what Google is selling, you know. They're selling the data of individual users, similar to media companies selling the attention of the audience to the advertisers. So there's lots of parallels there, I thought. So I was very curious, what are the players that Thomas Fetzer, you had in mind there um, who's owning the data. I, 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 please correct me if I'm wrong. I, I'm guessing you were thinking more of like companies, but I was also wondering about the individual user, similarly to what Marcus Strohmeyer was bringing up then. Um, also, the notion of interoperability resonated with me very much. <laughs> Even if we create a law, People need to share their data. I can share all my data sets with you and you will be almost, you will have no good way of making real use. I think that's something you can force people to share data and Facebook sometimes is sharing data, for example, but it's so difficult to use because they're not giving you all the codes. It's very inaccessible. So even if you in principle force people towards interoperability, Ability. That's a difficult word for me for some reason. <laughs> it, it can still be made very difficult for others to use your own data if you force that upon people. So, but I think that's really the future. If you want to get <clears throat> to a point where data become a lot more valuable to people, we probably have to create norms for easy exchanges. So that's kind of a law and business question is my, my thinking. Um, how do you create those norms, almost like converter tools from one platform to another to make data sets valuable to other people? And um, it's also reminding me of, of I, I, I wear a head of, of an editor and I'm supposed to encourage people to share their research data sets and we give out badges if you share your data for your journal publications, but people still don't do it, you know? So how do you get people to really share data? That's an, it's an intriguing question for me. How can we get there? I might be already at five minutes. I don't know, Yura, please stop me if you, you know. I have a few more thoughts, but I don't wanna to take too long here. Maybe one aspect that, uh, two thoughts on 
Florian Stahl's uh, presentation. So one thought that crossed my mind is I was very intrigued by this chart, uh, time to action. Uh, it could be milliseconds sometimes. I'm thinking of um, the, the auctions that occur when you click on a website and the website knows your profile from the cookies on your computer. They auction uh, amongst advertisers what ads are being shown and the time the site is loading. So that's in milliseconds that <laughs> the data about you is being used to tailor the advertising to you, also depending on your search terms and whatnot. So it could be milliseconds, but I think oftentimes it's months, if not years, because we often lack the expertise, the personnel, the modeling to make full uh, use the data to full advantage. I think a lot of that standardization still needs to happen to have standard models so that we get from months and years to milliseconds in some contexts. Um, and that's kind of the business that I'm in. I'm trying to develop the models that represent the psychological mechanisms for, for digital nudging, for psychological processing uh, processes that affect or uh, how people respond to messages or product display. So one question I thought I had about the Nike example was, um, it sounds so fabulous. Hey, this makes people happier. I, I was just thinking, which I agree with, but then I'm thinking about people overspending, people spending the money on things that they can't really afford. And also about products that are unhealthy. I'm okay with people maybe wasting their money on sneakers, but what about potato chips and high sugar soda? So I was just thinking of that. You can, there's also that kind of addictive aspect to that. You might use like the self-concept that you uh, make people think, oh, I'm this super healthy person. I'm using the Nike, whatever product site all the time, but you can also in, uh, induce very different self constructs that could be kind of harmful, you know? So that's kind of the stuff that was going on in my mind. And I think I'm gonna shut up here now. <laughs> it's just a lot more than five minutes, I'm afraid. So it's I'll, fine. Go mute. I'll go mute now, how's that? No. Okay, so my suggestion is, um, I also took someone say we have a number of questions. Uh, Florian, Thomas, would you like to answer some of these in the commentaries? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have necessary answers. I, I could react <laughs> to, to those questions and, and maybe add, add some more questions. So um, first of all, thank you very much for, for your comments and um, to to take some of the, the, the remarks and the questions. Um, and, and you you pointed out to one problem, do natural persons, do users get a fair share when they share their data with Amazon and Googles and the, and the others, and they make a lot of money with, with, the, with the data? So, so first of all, I, I would object to the observation that they get nothing in exchange. They at least get the service um, so you, you get Google search as a service and, and, and you, you get Amazon and, and all the services that come with Amazon and Facebook and so on and so forth. So we do see an exchange here. You get something for your data. The question then is, do you get enough for your data or, or do, you, do you pay a super competitive price? And then that's the point when it gets really tricky because in order to figure out whether you pay a super competitive price, you would have to know what the value of your data is. And, and then it gets circular to a certain degree. And, and actually there's currently um, a pending case at the Federal Cartel Office or the Competition Authority in Germany where the Federal Cartel Office is going after Facebook saying Facebook is charging its customers too much data for the service that they get. So because basically in its channel terms, uh, channel terms of services says basically give, my, give us all your personal data and you will get our service. And the Federal Card Office says that that's a, a too high price that Facebook has to pay. Um, my prediction is on, on that claim, um, this charge is probably going nowhere. And, and to a certain degree for, for good reason. We usually don't intervene in contract. You, you have a contractual relation with Facebook and, and you agree giving away your data and getting the service in exchange. And we usually don't intervene into, into that contractual relations. If I'm willing to pay, I don't know, 1 million euro for your newest article, 
be my guest. The law wouldn't prevent me from paying 1 million euro for your article, even if there is an imbalance of, of value. The only exception to that might be if there is an asymmetry of, of economic power uh, between the involved contractual parties. So if I have to be on Facebook and if I have to agree and, and, and if I just don't have another option, and, and that's the argument of, of the federal cartel office. I think what could solve this problem to a certain degree, I like your idea, Marcus, um, of, of taking out my data and or the data of people like me and then figuring out what, what Amazon can make out of that. Um, I think what we, my, my guess is at the end of the day, it will be a very, very low number in euros what, what you get out of that. And e even if it's one euro, I might not want to enforce or go to court and, and ask Amazon to get this one euro. What helps here and here and coming back, and of course, it's going back to my research. So I like the idea is, is having some, some kind of intermediary trust trustees or something like that who do that on behalf of me. And the best example that comes to my mind is we all suffered from delayed flights for a long time. How many of you actually in former times went to the airline and said, okay, according to the law, I get 100 euros from you, so please pay me. Um, I didn't because I knew how this is going to end up. They will say, no, this was some kind of things that we couldn't influence and so on and so forth. And eventually I would have succeeded. What changed this problem? We have now intermediaries like flight ride or whatsoever. I, I just tell them what flight was delayed. They say I get 40% of the revenue or of, of the damage claims that you get and you get the rest and they bundle these kind of claims. And, and that's something that we could see for, for data in, 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 in order to overcome this problem. The second point and, and then I will, the second point and I will stop is, um, or maybe two more points. Um, you said, what? and that's no. right, yeah. Can I ask no, you a ahead. question on this? Like, are you changing sure. topics? Yeah, I'm changing. I, I was about to change the topic, yeah. Can I ask you a follow-up question to the first point you made? Sure. Sure, because one thing, like, as a psychologist, I always think, like, of course, I think about individuals. And one, one thing it also came up in the questions here is actually about transparency. So how do I know as a user what I'm doing? And like in psychology, you could talk about nudges or boosts, for example. So a nudge would be you make a default and this is what happens. And I think this is the second example you described. So there's a general law claim. It's, it's in a way a default that, okay, this is, I just have to tick here and then I get 40%. So it's very easy. I make the right choice or the lawful choice, the easy choice. And then the second way it's, it's called a boost is I increase knowledge of a person so they can handle things better. But like when I listen to you, and I also listen to your talk, for a lay person, a lay individual user, it's very difficult to understand what happens with their data. Like if they even get to the point to think, like many of them probably don't even know what they do, like what data are collected and then what happens to them. So they, like what could be done to help them first understand what is going on and based on this make an informed decision or or choose an option if they wanted to like build a choice architecture for them? If I might give a very cynical answer, um, I don't think that um, increasing transparency and, and enabling the individual by giving the individual more information on what's happening with the data will solve any problem. Um, I actually think it makes things worse. And, and uh, the best thing that comes to my mind here is GDPR and consent, right? You are absolutely fully informed what's going to happen with your data. Have you ever read what's what, what you should have what you should read in order to understand it? No. Even if you read it, would you understand it? Probably you wouldn't. So the idea, I mean, the, the typical lawyer's answer, and, and thank you for the comment, the typical lawyer's answer is if you have an information asymmetry, is um, we create some kind of information obligation. Uh, hoping that the individual then will understand uh, what what's happening with the data, and I think this, in a perfect world, we could wish that, but I I don't think that this is going to happen. So my, my solution with that that we have. Um, again, third-party intermediaries who help to make informed decisions. I'll, I'll give you a consumer protection, for example. 
um, is, an, is, is a way. Um, do I read all the advices that I get if I buy a new product, uh, what I can do and what I shouldn't do and so on and so forth? I, I, I don't. Why? I know there's a consumer protection agency who goes through all that stuff. And if they really see a big problem, they will alert me or they will create some kind of information saying, don't use that product or you have to use it, that kind of product. Because I just think that the sheer amount of information for an individual is, is too much to comprehend and that creating transparency in theory from a legal point of view in theory is nice in practice i, I think it's 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 going nowhere um and, and I, I think it makes things even worse um so the way you create a default right because you say hey you can either uh, believe in the in this agency that does a good like the protection uh, consumer protection or you can try to like to learn about everything yourself and the vast majority of people will choose to have an informed um, entity doing this decision for them that they trust, right? Yeah. So you, what, what you basically need is a trusted third party, right? And and then you either you either actually trust that part, put trust in that party, or you will go through it your own. Some, something like, like the TÜV in, in Germany. I, I don't necessarily know what the English word for that would be. But, but they check whether all the standards and norms are satisfied, whether this is complying with the law, and they put a tag on it saying that's okay. And then you nevertheless can check on your own. So nobody prevents you from doing that. But you also could trust, tr put trust in this, uh, in this, in this institution. Yeah. So, and I just, uh, Pina uh, Yusar had the same question, or a very similar question. She said, uh, Thomas, how can awareness and capacity be implemented in data disclosure? Would that be the same answer? I, I think it's probably going in the same direction that we were just talking about. Uh, we, we shouldn't uh, also uh, for the sake of the individual, we shouldn't rely on the individual capacity of, of digesting what's what's happening with with the data because that inevitably leads to some kind of unfairness and asymmetry those those who are sophisticated and well educated enough to do that um they will will benefit from the systems those who aren't um they, they will not necessarily and, and 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 that's the reason why i'm arguing in, in favor of some kind of intermediaries or something like that um taking action on behalf of those who can't yeah, no, we do this in a lot of ways, right? If you think about, for example, nutrition, we now have a nutrition um, street light that is yeah. like, so you don't have to be a nutrition scientist. I mean, you do it in many ways. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Like, please go on to your next topic. Um, so the other two points were, um, you, I like that, Sylvia. Um, the more data is used, the better, right? And, and you don't necessarily know what, what you can use data for. I'm totally with you on that point. Um, the, the only fear that I have is, or the only um, concern that I have that the current legal system doesn't stimulate um, an increased use of data. And, and when, I was when I was listening um, to, to Florian's um, talk, um, that the problem that I see and why, why I see a, a potential problem of underuse of data is um, I, I have no doubt that companies are using data um, in-house to increase their efficiency, to improve their processes, to improve their own products, right? Um, my concern is that they don't have an incentive to share the data with, with others. And, and th thereby, um, there is a danger that data is not necessarily controlled by the person who makes the most efficient use out of it. And what I hear, uh, I've heard many times talking with, with companies is, and, and here we are in the, in the arena of, of non-personal data is, yeah, we have a lot of data, we don't really know what to do with it, but we won't share it with our competitors because imagine they have a great idea what they could do with the data. I will be in trouble, right? So before sharing the data with someone else who then makes use out of it, I, I'm not sharing it at all. And in, in terms of total welfare, this might be total welfare reducing. And, and one of the reasons is that we don't have any legal protection that allows them, for example, to license data, to say, okay, I share, I'm sharing my data with you, um, but I get a license fee if you... Um, if you make money with that, right? I can do this on a contractual basis, but then we are again um, in the situation that contracts are necessary incomplete. So I have a contract saying, if you make money with that business model, I get a license fee. 
And then out of a sudden, something happens that you described. They find out that they can use the data for a very different purpose where they now make money with. And then they argue, well, our contract only said we can do this. Uh, you only get money if we do this, do this in order to improve that or this product. And so I, I, I totally agree. Um, the more data is shared and can be used by, by different persons, the better. Just my worry is that the legal system doesn't necessarily incentivize um, that, that enough. And the last comment on, on interoperability, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the, 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 the legal concepts where I think if you hear it the first time, you think, wow, that's the solution. But the more you think about it, the more you think it's, it's not a solution. And the example that I'm always giving to my students, everybody is, is willing to share everything with everyone if the terms and conditions are right. right? If I ask you, do you share your apartment with, you, with me? You probably will say no. If I say, do you share my, your apartment with me if I pay you 1 million euros a day? Probably you will say yes. I, I don't know, okay. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of, 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 of the money. So, so the, the obligation to share data alone is useless. You need to then define what are the terms and conditions and, and the price is important and there it's hard to get it right. And, and then you need to define standards on which, so technical standards on which the data is shared, what format and so on and so forth. And, and, um, and that's, I mean, we, we have that kind of data portability obligation in the GDPR. And, and to, to my knowledge, it's almost not used at all, except for some academics who want to know what Google has uh, data at uh, what what Google has data has stored data of, of me, but for normal persons don't do it. But uh, what do I want to do if Google sends me uh, I don't know a USB plug with raw data? I mean that's nice. So uh, the, you, portability and interoperability theoretically can solve a lot of problems. But if you really want to implement them in practice, and then you have to define the things. I I share your your concerns or doubts. And that was really the last point that I want to make. Sorry for being long. Florian, is there anything you would like to add? Um, I can just add, I think I agree with all this discussion up to now. The value of data is, I think, um, of course, just happening when you use it. But the second thing is also, and that is, I think, the problem to really monetize the data is that often the value is created when you combine different data. So that is also the charm of big data. So it's not that the individual data set is the value, it's often the combination of various data sets and data sources even. And then of course, if you then ask, okay, what is the license fee for one? It's very difficult to say because when I create with this combination of different data sets together, 1 million, let's say in revenues. So I can argue, I think the individual data sets have just a value of 10 euros because they are meaningless for me, it's the combination. And that is also the problem then also even in the context of to negotiate also some fees. And the second is also in terms of the individual data. I think my own individual data to Amazon now still have a very low value. So that means, and that is also to any other, it's often the combination of thousands or millions. And then also of course, the application of the right model and uh, analytics also to this data. So Amazon would also argue if you don't want, go home and so we don't pay you anything for your data because you alone are have, it's not important for us. It's at the end, the combination and that is also um, what makes the value. So that means they can also then have millions of people and they can also make predictions now, for me, when I am in such a similar situation, let's assume now I am luckily not yet in the age of being retired, but of course my needs and my needs might change when I'm retired. But Amazon can then also use the, the data of the retired people today to make predictions to me when I'm getting retired. And that is also, of course, so then also makes the value. So then they argue, you know, you, we pay you zero cent for your data because it's not you. And that is, I think, also the problem now also of sharing benefits um, because they might always argue and they have also right because it's not the one observation. It's the, at the end, the, the millions of observations or the millions of uh, things. And that is, I think, the problem. But one thing to add here, and that is also one thing what I would be actually interested, um, it's also for companies. And that is also where law should also um, perhaps develop also some solutions in terms of contracts so in a sense that also it's very difficult now to think about the whole IoT context where 
companies share data and also for, for example, predictive maintenance. But now also uh, the question is, of course, also who is at the end owning the data? So that means also, of course, when I have, I sell a machine and also uh, my customer wants the, to share some data that also machine is always working, of course, that makes a lot of sense. But then at the end is this data, which the customer sends to me for predictive maintenance, also my data, or is this actually the data of um, the, the, the customer of my customer. So of course I might consider this as my data because the customer sent this data to me back for predictive maintenance. And I can of course also do a lot of other things with this data, not just pre analyzing predictive maintenance. I can also analyze the whole behavior of my customer and can use it for sales or whatever. So the, and then also it's getting of course problematic. So that is also um, because my customer don't want that I track him, how he is using the, the machine um, beyond predictive maintenance. And that is now the, the, the dark zone. Of course, you can write a contract about it, but still I use it a little bit, let's say, um, to understand how my customer is using the machine. And then I also understand how valuable this machine is for you. And all this is, and that is the reality. I talked to major, and we talk here about really one of the biggest machinery companies in the world. And I ask them in all your contracts you make also with your customers, is there anything written about, you know, who's owning the data shared now for whatever reason. And actually, and that is for me the biggest surprise is that up to now, they write not any paragraph about it. So that means it's basically not specified. It's um, now the question is, and that might happen, that is, I think we are law should also prepare some, some solution. I guess they meet in five or 10 years in front of a court because then also um, they realize that this is now a problem. Which um, is good uh, news for lawyers. They will earn a lot if, of money then. If, if they again can, can go to court, maybe two reactions. I mean, one, one point is, um, what the law could or what could be done to to lower transaction costs for negotiating this kind of contracts is that we have some standard model contracts or so we we also know this from privacy law where we have standard model terms um with, which are published by the european commission and, and if you follow that model at that that lowers your transaction cost and you don't have to negotiate the same contract and you and a new and, and you have a certain standard which by being a standard again uh, lowers transaction cost um, the other observation that I have, I, I totally share uh, your experience that there is nothing much in, in those contracts who owns data. Uh, my experience is ownership is determined here by who controls the data. Um, so as, and, and with control, I mean factual, actual control, right? So if, if it's on my servers, um, people will assume that it's their data and, and, and that's how they, how they deal with that. And that, that can be a problem. Um, again, in, in terms of efficiency, um, it might not be that, that I'm the most efficient, making the most efficient use out of that. And um, in, in terms of legal certainty. And um, I, I, I agree with you, there's definitely something where law could contribute um, a lot by, by either, again, defining a new kind of property, intellectual property right, uh, assigning that kind of property to, to one or the other person, um, however, I, I, I will admit it's not easy to decide who you should assign that property right to initially um, because the argument is, um, yeah, I'm contributing that data because I'm operating this machine and if I didn't operate that machine, there was no data and so on. And, so on. and the counter argument is if there, if there wasn't a machine that had the sensors to collect the data, there wouldn't be any data. And, and so the, the question who you assign that data property right initially is, is not a trivial one. But, um, and that's good news for researchers like you and me. There's a lot of, tool, uh, a lot of things to work on and to think about. Thank you. Marcus, what is your experience? Um, where are the biggest uh, challenges for the value of data now if you like put it in context with law and economics? So I've been using mostly social data in the last couple of uh, years uh, and looking at it from a research perspective and not so much from an economic perspective. And I think I'm not an expert in uh, privacy, uh, GDPR, but it seems like uh, GDPR has certain provisions for research that allows 
researchers uh, to use uh, data for research purposes. Um, for econ economic purposes, I think it seems to me this is very much the Wild West right now. Uh, this is completely unexplored uh, territory, uh, having things not even specified, like uh, Florian Stahl mentions in uh, relations between uh, customers and organizations. Uh, that sounds to me like uh, Wild West. Uh, th those, those things are done because they can be done right now. Um, it seems to me also that there are technological advances, uh, advances in, in uh, crypto economics, for example, that allow the owners of data to exert more control over how their data is being used. So there could be, we, we can envision today platforms where using the data requires explicit um, confirmation uh, by a user uh, for a specific case before the data is being used. It could be encrypted per default and running analysis on the data would require decryption before using it. Uh, and it could be done in such a way that the person who analyzes the data cannot even read it. So that it's essentially hidden from the entity that does the data analytics uh, and it is only released on a per request basis. I, I don't think we have any of this infrastructure uh, running and readily available right now, but I think technologically uh, it can be envisioned and it can be engineered. Uh, I'm curious to see to what extent such solutions actually will uh, be deployed in, in real uh, business relationships. Uh, that I think remains to be seen. But there, I think um, we could come into a situation where uh, we don't rely on a legal framework that enacts uh, right but we have to a certain extent the opportunity to write code that automatically enforces certain agreements, uh, sort of contracts that make sure that uh, obligations are uh, satisfied. And therein might lie an opportunity, uh, but I understand that the world that we live in today uh, is different uh, from, from this uh, perhaps um, future that one could, uh, Envision today already. Um, so, yes, uh, right now I think the issue, and I've I've been uh, with Gazes uh, for many years now, where Gazes certainly has an interest in identifying companies that would be willing to share data, and we've been in touch with companies in the past uh, and see whether it would be possible that their data could be shared uh, for research purposes, um, and. There are so many questions uh, when taking on data and releasing it one way or the other as an infrastructure provider uh, that sometimes companies are becoming uh, scared and sometimes uh, the infrastructure provider is getting scared. And the combination of all these things makes it really hard uh, to have a clear pathway of taking on data from, let's say, industrial platforms or industrial applications that are of research value um, and finding a way to share them with, with the broad user base. That doesn't mean that it's, it's not happening. I mean, there are people like, uh, there are companies like PushShift.io, for example, they understand themselves to be a data provider for social media platforms and they do it in an API based way so that data can also be deleted uh, and things like that. Um, but uh, I think there is certainly a lack of clear uh, clarity of how these things could be done. Florian? You know, uh, just also to say, you know, also say something about this because I think it's a great comment which you make here. So the only problem is, and that is also what more, more and more companies realized or also more and more companies will realize in the future is that of course company data were in companies more like such a side product. So they happen and yeah, you can use it for controlling, that's it. So, but now also the more the data gets in the core of a business and also the whole revenues is 
uh, depending on this data. So the more it's actually getting also a competitive advantage also to build some very advanced, whatever analytics and things around the data. And obviously uh, that's why I am not believe that also um, companies are willing to share also what they do with the data, because that might also of course show the competitors basically their competitive advantage. And that is also um, when you think about recommendation systems, why people like also some platforms or some also devices, it is because they actually analyze the data in a way which brings actually more benefit than the other. And that is also why I use now, let's say also Google Maps. I'm not a friend of Google, but also I use it because it's often better than actually alternative services. And that is also then the reason that of course Google says, we cannot share this algorithm, which we use with your data because Otherwise, the competitor would also know also how actually um, you build such a service. And obviously, I agree. So this is a competitive advantage. Also, we have also patents and also protection also for other you know, industries. So that means also here, it's basically um, a secret. So therefore, and they will, given that they build their revenues and they make, I guess, uh, some millions, billions with this data in Google. So I'll uh, definitely not share with me as a user also what they do with this data in Google Maps, let's say. And then also, it's not because of me, they also don't know that I'm not working for the competitor. Because when they share it with me, basically the competitors also knows it. And that is also then of course the problem. So therefore I think that is also, you know, the, 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 what now companies realize, and that is getting to the core of our discussion here, that value at least from a company perspective, and also actually even for, individuals are getting to a huge value. So this is, um, you know, just um, to, you know, you, you, you can also see um, uh, there exist actually also some psychology interesting experiments so that you take the, the phone or some devices from people and then also say, okay, you cannot get it in the next days. And then also they are starting to cry because they need this data. So therefore also, um, so that means also here we have a lot of also value also on the consumer side, of course. So, and that is, I think all this, um, what um, at the end, of course, might lead to benefits uh, which are not equally shared. So that is, uh, but, I'm, but I have some doubts that in the moment, the consumers are actually also trained for this whole thing, because I think most have not this data literacy and they just accept all terms and conditions. And then also, and that is also why I also get, getting back to our discussion in general, so that most data, which I also produce privately, let's say on some smart devices um, are owned, by not by me. So that means also I agree to some terms of that all these smart devices um, are actually owned by the, the ones who, who actually implement the sensor in these um, devices. And that is also, I think here specified in a company context, in a B2B context, it's not as much specified like in the private context. So that means if you have whatever a smart watch, so that basically implies that also um, the, the data are owned by the producer of this smartwatch. And consumers accept it. So it's not that they, are, they clicked on some whatever I accepted at the beginning when they started first time this smart device. Actually, I do this also. So this is, um, you know, even I think about it and talk about it, but the next device you give to me, I will I accept it. Maybe because you trust the law or the terms. The law and also, you know, also time. It, you know, I, I think we all have a time constraint. Nobody has time to read now, or whatever, a 30 page long PDF. Yeah. Silvia, last question to you before we close the panel in three minutes. Um, where, do you, um, where do you see the biggest challenges or where do you see the future of the value of data and communication science. I mean, you talk about sharing from an editor perspective, but what other issues do you foresee? Well, let's try to end on a positive note. Maybe we got to step uh -huh. closer to the big solutions. I think it's really an interdisciplinary challenge. It's ranging from law, business, uh, psychology, communication, very heavily involved is computer science, the development of algorithms. And getting these people to speak to one another is, I think, a major hurdle. The people or the research teams, the businesses who manage to accomplish that, that people really 
find the right interfaces and the right language to solve these very interdisciplinary problems, I think these will be, that's the key to success. I mean, that's the perfect start to like uh, the final words on this panel, because that's exactly what um, we were invited to do. And I thank you very much, everyone, for this very interesting enterprise. I learned a lot. And um, I think we should continue talking because that might be the first step on the way to solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jutta. And, and thanks to um, our panelists here. This was a very interesting and I think very thoughtful discussion. And, and I learned a lot and I hope everybody here in this call also, also learned a lot. Um, with that, we have reached the end of our program, I would say. And um, with that, I want to actually um, thank everybody who was involved in uh, putting this together. So the, the folks at uh, the Manam Business School, um, every, everybody behind the scenes at IPSDS, um, so uh, Annika and, and Markus and, and many others who have put a lot of effort into, into getting the program together and, and, and making sure that everybody knows uh, what they were supposed to be doing, especially me and Frauke, and we really appreciated that. But once again, thank you so much to all our speakers, um, both um, early on in the career panel, uh, uh, Liz Stewart, who gave a wonderful keynote, and, and then again, Jutta and, and Florian Stahl, Silvia uh, uh, Knobloch, Westerwick, um, to, uh, Thomas Fetzer and Marco Strohmeyer here for, for um, having this insightful uh, discussion. With that, uh, again, a reminder, we offer a lot of courses in, as part of the International Program Serving Data Science here in Mannheim, if you're interested feel free to reach out to us. Uh, Manon Pfeiffer is the admissions manager. Uh, she's happy to help you. If you have questions for us, please contact us. And um, with that, one, one more time, thank you everybody. Um, keep in touch with us and look out for other things. Next year, hopefully we'll have a live in-person meeting in Mannheim. And we're very much looking forward to seeing everybody in person at some point again.